Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning here to worship together. I do have a few things that I'd like to share with you before we get started by reading a passage of scripture, a few announcements. Some of these that you've heard, it's mainly just to remind you of what's going on. And I know that some of you may not have been here in the last couple weeks, but uh, if you were not here last week, last week we handed out copies of the uh, budget for the upcoming year. And they, those were in the seats. Uh, and we're going to be voting on that next week after service. And uh, if you did not get one of those, I believe there are still copies at both welcome centers as you come into the building. I want to make sure that you're informed, that you know what that is, that you know what you're voting on for that. And so uh, be sure you pick up a copy of that, read over it, understand it, ask questions if you have questions. We'll be happy to answer those. Uh, but we'll be voting on that next week. Also, we have announced uh, and let people know that uh, the nursery will, is going to be open starting next week. We're going to have people in there for uh, kids and understand that this is just going to be the two youngest classes. We'll have our, our uh, cribs class and then we also have our two and three year olds class that's going to be open for that. And so uh, we want to serve you parents well and help you in that. Things will potentially continue to open up as time goes on, but we're just going to be starting with those things for now. Uh, and then, of course, you know uh, our regular pattern by now that uh, during our first song, if you have an offering that you haven't brought already, you can bring it to the plates in the front. There's also plates in the back that you can uh, take it to there. But uh, if you would uh, read with me Psalm 30, I'm going to be reading verses 4 and 5 and 11 and 12 uh, this morning as we begin to prepare our hearts for worship coming to the Lord. And so this is Psalm 30, 4 and 5 and 11 and 12. It says, sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. If you would join me this morning as we give thanks to our God. Heavenly Father, we do come here with thankful hearts. God, each one of us in our own life, as we've come to you, as we've lived, God, that we have, we have experienced moments like this that we know where there is sadness that is tearing, there is there is trial, but we know joy comes in the morning. And God, we have hope in you, and we trust you that though we experience difficulties, your guiding hand is with us. And we know that joy will come to us soon. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your kindness towards us. God, even moments that we have where we are experiencing your discipline, the loving discipline of a father, we know that it is your discipline out of love. And that even though we are experiencing that for a moment, we know that your favor towards us is for a lifetime. Father, we don't deserve that. When we've made a mistake, and you've shown us kindness, and then we make a mistake again, and you show us kindness again. Lord, there is surely no one that is as loving and caring towards us as you are. And Lord, would you remind us of that today? Would you help us see that? It's hard to see sometimes. But would you help us see it? Would you help us know it and, and trust you in your hand? God, thank you for leading us, for holding us, for keeping us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Let's stand and sing a song of praise this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Like never before 
for oh my soul I'll worship your holy name the sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like that slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near. And my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. be seated. <clears throat> this morning we want to read together from Psalm 51 verses 1 through 12. We're beginning second or first Samuel and going to be going into second Samuel which of course tells us the story of David and uh, tells us about God's king. But of course Psalm 51 one of the most beloved of Psalms is David's Psalm after he had committed what we think of as his most public and uh, scandalous sin and he experienced God's mercy Psalm 51 have mercy on me O God according to your steadfast love according to your abundant mercy blot out my transgressions wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, 
and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. One of the things that happens when we come to church, I don't know if it happens to you, but it does to me, is we sing songs of praise, but oftentimes they sound hollow coming from my heart because I realize I'm not the person I should be. And how can I take those words in my mouth and mean them? One of the wonderful things about coming to church is if we don't do anything else or get anything else of coming to church, we're reminded that though we're sinners, God forgives us in Christ. And so if you come to church for one thing, come once again to receive God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And that's where God meets us down in the dirt and in the muck of our lives. And that's what this psalm is about. God meets us, forgives us, pardons us, and makes us his children and fills us with joy in our hearts for gratitude, for grace received. Let's pray together, asking God to forgive us of our sins and that he would be with us as we continue to worship him. Will you pray with me? Merciful God of David, God who looks down upon us and pities us and sees us in the mess and the wreck that we have made in Adam, you look down and you see us as humanity, and all of us are individuals, but also connected to the whole group of, of the human race. And whenever you look down upon us, Heavenly Father, you see a human race that has gone astray, that the intentions of our heart are evil only continually that we are in rebellion against you and that we don't love each other the way we should and we certainly don't love you as we should. So often, Father, we forget that our sin is not primarily against each other, but it's against you. As David said, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And Father, we know that if you should count our sin against us and if you should judge us all as we deserve, no man could stand. But we praise you and we thank you that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, we are reckoned righteous, we are accepted, we are put in a place of blessing where before we were in a place of curse and it's all because Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. It's all because he was born of the Virgin Mary, born by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's all because he fulfilled the law whenever none of us did. It's because he obeyed you every day, every hour, every minute of his life, whenever I and the rest of us have not done that perfectly for one second of our lives. It's because that whenever the time came, he accepted the cross and bore the shame and took our place and was made sin for us. And it's because of his righteous, perfect, complete, finished, and without parallel sacrifice, that we are saved. And he rose again and is seated at the right hand of you, Father. And we look forward to seeing him again one day. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would pardon us of our sins. We rejoice in the forgiveness that we have in him. We pray that this would uh, change the way that we treat each other, that you would help us to love one another as Christ has loved us and given himself for us. We pray that this would change the way we view our marriages that because Christ died, we would live sacrificially towards one another, that this would change the way we parent, the way we view each other in the church and in society. We pray for those in our congregation who are sick and ill, those who uh, perhaps are struggling, continuing with the, the, the situation that we find ourselves in providentially. We pray that you would uphold them and give them the strength that they need. We pray that as we worship you this morning, that you would fill our hearts with gratitude for the great grace that we have received in Jesus Christ. 
And though our sins are many, your mercy is more. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's once again stand and sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Is Christ in me? Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God. How I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God. How I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Glad you're here this morning. It's good to see you. Take your Bibles if you have them, and we'll be in 1 Samuel, as it shows on the screen there, the Old Testament. We're going to work our way through 1 and 2 Samuel. Not all of 2 Samuel, we'll probably get to about chapter 7, chapter 8 or so, and then we'll finish. But today our goal is to get through the first three chapters. I'm not going to read all of the chapters, though this morning I'll trust that you can do that on your own or have already done that as well. 
but we will read uh, some of it together. We do need to do a little bit of an introduction into this, into this book, into these two books. First and Second Samuel really are one book uh, together. It was later separated, uh, but it can definitely be read just as one book and should be read as one book. And it shows us, it shows us the story of Israel's kingdom taking shape and really how that happened, how that, how that came about. And then it goes all the way into uh, with King David, uh, first King Saul, then King David. And so it's, it's a very important book for us. And I, I can't stand here today and tell you all the reasons. There's, there's a few reasons, though, that I just want to pinpoint for us to be really mauling over in our head and thinking about all while we read this book together and study this book together. First, it's important because of the Davidic covenant. So there's covenants throughout Scripture. And the one that God establishes with David is a very important one. And we see this in Samuel. And we'll, we'll get there. We don't have to go into that too much right now at this moment. But that God would promise David that from his line the Messiah would come. And we see this with, within Samuel, First and Second Samuel. We also see God working out, as I already mentioned, with the Davidic covenant, the, the true line of the Messiah and the importance of that. And then also First and Second Samuel points us to the fact that we are looking forward and looking to the true king. It's really important for the times that we find ourselves in now. I want you to know that we will not find the true king today being born in America or rising to power here in America or even becoming our president. It's not going to happen because the true king has already been established and the true king is already on the throne in heaven. That we can be certain of. And yes, we look forward to the day because we're still in waiting for the day to when the kingdom and the king will reign here. We don't, we don't see that. But today, sadly, when uh, there are polls taken amongst church folk, among, amongst the evangelicals, sadly the statistics are telling us that many Christians are putting more hope in the politics of the land than they are in the God of Scripture. And that's troubling because I said it's not a poll in America. It's a poll amongst evangelicals in America. So it's, it's a poll amongst people sitting in the pews all across our country that they put more hope in this idea of America or the things of America than they do in the God of the Bible. And that's, that's a problem because as Christians... We are people of Scripture. We are people of the Bible. We are people who trust in God and who know the truths of God. At least we should. And we know the beginning and we know the end. We, we have these answers. Now, we don't know necessarily how everything is going to play out. That's one of the things that brings us fear with uncertainty in uncertain times. But one of the things that First and Second Samuel really points us to, and we'll see, is that Israel wanted to be like other nations. They wanted to be like the nations around them. They wanted a visible king that they could point to and say that this is our leader. Even though God was their leader, God was the one who was to be in charge of them. They, they wanted this king to be in place. And as we'll see as we go through First and Second Samuel, it doesn't, doesn't work out all that well. They start to become like the people around them. They start to act like the nations that are around them. And the, and the kings that they put in place are not perfect. They're, they're not necessarily even good people. They're not people that you would look to and say, well, no wonder they follow him because look at, look at this. No, they, they fail. They fail so many times. I mean, the psalm that we read this morning, Psalm 51, comes from, as, as uh, Spencer was saying, the greatest king that Israel had, his sin of, a, of adultery and murder that he would commit. And so we see the, the faultiness of this thinking that, you know, that this, we could have this king, and if he's a good guy, he's a good person, then, then we will be okay. Everything is going to be all right. We, we see this as we move through First and, and Second Samuel. And so we will see God's hand moving as we go through this book together, moving amongst good people, as I've said, as bad people, bad decisions being made, faithful people, faithless people, kind of similar to the book of Esther, how we'll still see God's hand moving undoubtedly uh, of what is happening throughout history here. 
And then, as I had already mentioned, we see Israel's desire to be like other nations with a visible king and how it just simply doesn't solve the problem. Now, it does need to be noted, and I do want to say this before we go on too far, that all the way back, even in Deuteronomy and in the book of Judges, God really had already set up the fact that a king was going to come and that a king was going to take place. Because if you, if you look at the law in Deuteronomy, there are already laws that God had established for the king of the land, even though there wasn't a king that had taken place. And so it's, it's not as if the people were like, hey God, we want a king, and God said, uh, sure. It, it wasn't that. I mean, this, we, we, again, we see God's hand moving, we see his plan unfolding, and so this isn't something that takes him by, by surprise. Well, let's look at, at first, cha- first Samuel uh, chapter 1. I'll read uh, verses 1 through, 1 through 7 here. And like I said, I, I don't know if we'll read all, we're not going to read all three chapters together, but I will, I'll do my best to summarize some of the points. But let's look here at the intro. It says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerohom, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. We really enter this book kind of on a Sad note, do we not? Uh, it's not, not a lot of happy things going on here. We're introduced to this, this family, uh, this family that is a messed up family from the get-go because there's not one husband and one wife. We see one husband and, and two wives taking place here, which, which is not something that God had ordained from the foundation of time. He said one man, one woman together here, but we see Elkanah here not obeying that. He has two wives, and we learn very quickly that within the home there's issues. Within the home there's problems, because one of his wives, Hannah, who he seems to love more than the other, cannot have children. She's barren. The other wife, Peninnah, who I don't know if he just doesn't love her or what, it doesn't really say, I guess, there, but she's very fruitful. She just, it sounds like, just pops out kids constantly. She's always having children, sons and daughters that keep Keep coming from her. And it says that Peninnah and Hannah had a relationship that was actually rivals of each other. That Peninnah would constantly be aggravating Hannah saying, you can't have kids. I don't know why he loves you more. Now we could read into this. I, I, I'm not a woman and I, I don't understand all of this completely and how this would feel and, and this experience fully, but but many of you maybe, maybe will. But I can't imagine being Hannah who wants nothing more than to have children. Because you have to understand the times too. If you were a woman and you were not having children, you were nothing. You didn't exist. There, were, there was no point to you in society. You were not doing what you were called to do, which was to have more kids for, for the land and for your family so that your husband's name could continue on. And so if you weren't able to do that, you really were worthless And so that's the weight that Hannah had on her. And although her husband Elkanah would come to her and give her a double portion of food when it would come time to thing and try to show her blessings, the whole time behind his back, Penn and I, you can picture her, really, I think it was Jen Wilkin who put this picture in my head listening to her talk about it, but you have Penn and I in the background rubbing her pregnant belly like you pregnant women do all the time. You rub your your belly all the time, looking at her just kind of saying, yeah, but this is never going to be you. He might give you more food, but you can't give him kids. You're worthless. And you can imagine Penina, you know, at home talking to her kids, and the kids, I don't know how they talked about each other, if they called Hannah mom or aunt or whatever. I don't know how that works in a house with multiple wives. But they might ask their mom, 
You know, what, what's going on with Aunt Hannah? Well, you know, we love Aunt Hannah, but she just can't have kids. Well, Mom, why can't Aunt Hannah have kids? Well, God just hasn't blessed her that way, like she's blessed me. Now, I can imagine that's got to be a difficult situation to find yourself in. Even if your husband does give you a double portion. If you go on to look at verses 8 through 18, you can read those if you want while I'm talking, but I'm going to try to summarize that. In his very weak attempt, I would say, Elkanah does his best to comfort Hannah because he sees that she's frustrated and that she's hurting. And he says a phrase, I'd love to get your wife's reactions to this. I know what my wife's reaction would be to this, no doubt. But if you look at what he says to her, he says, Baby, ain't I enough for you than more than sons, any sons you could ever have? As if he's something special, right? As, as, as if he, I should just be, look at my greatness. Look at, I, I, you're married to me. Why would, you, why would you need anything else? Well, if you continue on after verse 8, you'll see this didn't work out very well. It didn't calm her at all. She actually then goes and she is praying and she's seeking the Lord so much so that Eli, the priest of the time, sees her and assumes that she is drunk because her lips are moving but nothing is coming out. And he's actually frustrated at her. This woman who is broken over her situation, over what is going on in her life. The priest doesn't show her much sympathy, but says, stop drinking. Put the bottle away. Get up. This is embarrassing. And she says to Eli, she says, I, I am not drunk. She assures him of this. But tells him, my heart is broken before the Lord. And, and tells him why. And when Eli hears this story from Hannah, he looks at her and he says, he blesses her and says, may God grant your request then. And it's interesting because when the priest says this to Hannah, scripture tells us that she ends up getting up and all of a sudden joy comes into her life that the priest has told her this. That the priest has said, go and let your grant be made known to God and let him request it. Just a couple verses later, Verses 19 through 28, we see that the Lord does this. It says that Hannah and Elkanah go home, that Elkanah knows his wife, and that she then conceives Samuel, this child that God blesses her with. Can you imagine the joy that must have come to this once barren woman? And as I say that, I'm under the realization that some of you might exactly know this situation. Some of you ladies here today might have experienced something similar to this, where you were told you couldn't have children, but then you, but then you did. Or some of you ladies were told, uh, I can't have kids, and you can't. And so you, when we talk about Hannah, you really can grasp what's going on here, way better than I could uh, in my life. But God blesses her with this, with this child. And this is a child that she had promised to the Lord. She had told the Lord in her prayers and her petitions before God saying, listen, if, if you were to give me a child, I will give him back to you. I'll give him back to you. And so we see that, we actually see that happen. That after Hannah weans him off probably two or three years, that Hannah then takes this child Samuel to Eli and drops him off there. And then, e then Samuel is raised there in the temple with Eli. As you get to chapter 2, which we'll read at the end of the message, we're going to get back to it. But it's really one of the most famous portions of Scripture. Hannah's prayer or Hannah's song, it is sometimes referred to. And we see this praise that is coming from Hannah, this, this once barren woman who is now fruitful. This, one, this once woman who is hopeless, who now has been given hope and a surety. And all that can come from her is this song of praise that we see in chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. In verses 1 through 3, she praises God for the fact that her grief has been turned to joy. In verses 4 through 8, she praises the Lord for his character and how this is very befitting of his character of what he has done for her. And then in verse 9 through 10, she goes to talk about how this character of the Lord is going to actually see his promises through and praises him for those promises that are being made and given. So just like other examples that we have of this throughout Scripture, you can think of Mary with Jesus, 
Remember, Mary has a song, how she bursts forth with praise when she's understanding what is going on. Hannah, the same way, couldn't help herself but to praise the Lord for his goodness to her. Because again, he has took her from worthless to having worth. And that's a big deal. That's a very big deal. As you continue on in chapter 2, verse 12 through 17, it talks about the wickedness of Eli's family, who are the priests of the land. So the ones who are supposed to be leading and guiding the people in holiness are actually doing the exact opposite. Scripture tells us uh, in verses 12 through 17 that Hophni and Phinehas were committing sexual sin quite frequently within the temple. Also that they were abusing their power for illegal consumption of food. If you go back again to the law, the priests were given a portion of all the sacrifice to eat. Well, that was not enough for them. And so they actually, by force, it's kind of crazy, it's actually by force, they would go to the people of the land with a fork. I imagine it was a big fork. And they would reach in as the food was cooking, and they said, you've already given us our portion, but whatever we pull out, this is ours as well. And if people tried to talk to them about it and would say, whoa, 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 we've already given you what you get, they would say, I'll beat you up. I mean, you can read it in there. It's what I said. We will take this by force if we have to. This is what you have to do for us. And we can't necessarily look at Eli as being uh, outside of this realm because he would eat of it as well, and he would do nothing about it, that his son, uh, the, the wickedness that his sons were doing. But yet, in the midst of this story of, of talking about wickedness, there's still this guy, Samuel, this little kid that was given to Eli, that Eli now is raising in the temple, and it continually is talking about how Samuel actually is a blessing. Look at verses 18 of chapter 2. It says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. So just talked about the wickedness of these priests, and then it says, But Samuel, the child, continued to minister. And so we see this goodness in Samuel that is happening here. And if you continue to read verses 19, 20, and 21, you'll see how his mother would come yearly and bring Samuel clothes that she had made for him or that she had got for him. She loved her son. And so I don't want you to think of this picture of how could this mother give her son up. Uh, She just must be a horrible, ruthless woman. No, that, that wasn't the case. She had promised him to the Lord, and she was fulfilling that promise. And she was showing her love to her child by continually bringing him these Things. And scripture even tells us that the Lord blessed Hannah with more children. It wasn't just Samuel. that She actually had more after that. Again, we see that in verses 18 to 21. Then as you go uh, to verse 22, Eli finally gets some guts. And he, he goes to his sons who are just wicked in the land. And he says, hey, what you guys are doing isn't, isn't good. You shouldn't be doing these things. The report that I'm hearing from people is that you're bad. And I wish that you, I wish that you wouldn't do this. But if you look at verse 25, this is a very interesting verse. I want to point it out to us. It says, if one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? This is Eli talking to his sons. And then we have this interesting thing. It says, nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Now, that's an interesting little passage there, isn't it? That's something that we've got to grapple with. The Lord desired to kill them. There was no repentance that would take place there because the Lord desired to kill them. You see, what we see happening here is they had absolutely no interest in the things that their dad was saying. They knew what they were doing was wicked. They knew what they were doing was against the Lord. But they didn't care. Inside of their heart was fully corrupt. There was absolutely no repentance. Nothing that would be said would solve the problem. And so they had given themselves up to these evil desires, and the Lord had given them up to the evil desires of their heart as well, as we see Scripture talk about. I pulled a a quote from, actually it's a commentary that's for sale back there uh, that we're using, uh, Dale Ralph Davis, of his commentary in 1 Samuel. I want to read this section because this can be a really hard passage and I think people can can struggle with it. And he does a good job of explaining it, but then also of challenging us of 
of being weary of going to two extremes when reading this verse. So, so please listen to this. It's, it's a real short paragraph. It says, We cannot divorce verse 25 from the previous account of Hophni's and Phineas' impotence and immorality. In that light, verse 25b, the second part there, says that for their persisting rebellion, Yahweh decided to put them to death, and that therefore they had not listened to Eli's plea. So the text teaches that somebody can remain so firm in his rebellion that God will confirm him in it, so much so that he will remain utterly deaf to and unmoved by any warnings of judgment or pleas for repentance. Listen to this last section. Be careful of your response to such teaching. Some of you may become Yahweh's prosecutors, alleging he is deficient in mercy. Others may be intellectually curious about the mechanics of hardening. At what precise point in sin's progress does it become impossible to repent? Both the critic and the curious are wrong. Our place is not to question or to comprehend but to tremble before a God who can justly make sinners deaf to the very call to repentance. Now I want you to grasp that. Because this is something that I hear a lot of people struggle with, and it's conversations that seem to happen often. Because what this is saying is they've gotten so far in their sin that the Lord has made them deaf to understanding the call of salvation. It's not happening for them. He's given them over to their corruption. Now, you can't look at God and say, God, this is you. This is your fault. This is your problem. No, it's their fault. It's their problem. It's their sin. They've lived in this sin. Right? So we, so we can't look and say, God, you're, you're not a merciful God. We can't prosecute God here. There, there's a danger there of doing that because you're starting to tell God he doesn't have a plan and it's not a good one. Or if he does have a plan, it's not good. Yours would be better. But on the flip side, it's dangerous to start going, well... How far can someone go in their sin before the door is closed? Uh, how, how much can I, can I push? You see, that, that's a scary realm to get into too because that's a slippery slope, is it not? Maybe you've lived that life before. Uh, is this sin really a sin? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I meant good when I did it. I know the Bible says I shouldn't do it. Maybe uh, how far can I get away we get into these little games with ourselves and it doesn't lead to anything good. And I loved how uh, Dale Davis there says, what we need to understand is we need to tremble before a God who does these things instead of trying to question him. Well, there's good news that we see here in 1 Samuel chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2. Out of nowhere, we have an unnamed man go to Eli and start speaking judgment to the priests. We're not told who this person is. It doesn't say anywhere. But he speaks judgment to Eli's family because of their sin and their unwillingness to budge from it. And what he says, he says, listen, this is what the Lord has established. Your sons are going to die. And he says, in fact, Eli, know this. There is not going to be an old man in your house anymore. Kind of pronouncing Eli's death as well. But he says, know this. The Lord will not leave Israel without a priesthood. It will be established by a faithful priest. That is what this man says. It's, it's, there at, it's there at the end of chapter 2. You can see that. And now when we talk about them, it's in verse 35. It says, Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before my anointed forever. Now some people want to say that this is Samuel. I don't believe this is referring to Samuel. Some people say that this priest is referring to Christ, which I guess in the big picture in the end we could say that this is true. But we actually see in 1 Kings chapter 2 that this was fulfilled by Zadok and his family when Solomon put him as priest because it actually says in there which fulfills the line of Eli and the promise made to Eli there. And so that's where the fulfillment takes place for those of you like me who want to nerd out on that stuff sometimes. I don't want to leave you hanging there. But also you'll notice there in verse 35 and 36 that it talks about an anointed one. This is where we see Samuel start to point us to Christ already. We're being pointed to Christ, the anointed one, that the priesthood will walk before the anointed one. Now, I don't know how many of you know this. Many of you call Jesus, Jesus Christ. You would say Jesus Christ. Do you know what Christ means? 
anointed one. That's what you're saying. Jesus, the anointed one. The chosen one of God. And it's already being pointed to here in 1 Samuel. Well, as we get to chapter 3, verse 1, all the way through chapter 4, verse 1, we see the Lord call Samuel out. And this might be a story that you've heard before. Samuel is in bed. He hears somebody call out to him. He runs over to Eli and says, Eli, what do you want? And Eli says, I I didn't call for you. Confused, he goes back to bed. He hears the voice again. He runs to Eli. What do you want, Eli? I'm not calling you. It's at this time that Eli wonders, maybe maybe it's the Lord speaking to Samuel. So he tells Samuel, next time you hear that voice, just say, Lord, here I am, your servant. And so the Lord calls out to Samuel again. Samuel responds to the Lord, and the Lord has a thing to tell him. But it's not good news. It's assuring Samuel of the prophecy that had already been told to Eli earlier in judgment, that his family was going to be destroyed. And so Samuel hears this from the Lord. Eli comes to him and says, Samuel, what does the Lord say to you? You have to let me know. And so Samuel tells him the bad news. And it says that Eli actually was thankful that Samuel had told him this. And then we see that we are told that Samuel continues to grow in the Lord. And he gains favor in the land as a prophet of God. And God establishes this in Shiloh where the temple is. That is how chapter 3 ends in the beginning of verse 4. Look at it. Look at it at verse 19 of chapter 3. It says, So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And then notice the first verse of chapter 4. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. The writer there comparing the word of the Lord to the word of Samuel, how they basically were one, how God was using Samuel and speaking through Samuel as a prophet. Now, there's a lot there, a lot of chapters there. What do we see happening in these three verses, or these three chapters? Well, I think there's three things, and I want us to hear this this morning, and this will carry out as we continue on through this book. Number one, we all need to understand, myself and you included, is that Scripture tells us very clearly that sin will be dealt with one way or another. Where you sit right now currently in your life, I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know how things are going for you spiritually, how close you feel to the Lord. I don't even know if you have a relationship with the Lord. That's between you and Him. But we need to all understand this. The sin that we are currently engaged in is going to be dealt with. And that can be a difficult thing to think about. The Bible is very clear to all of us that everyone sins. We see here in this passage, these three chapters, that even the priests of God, these people who are supposed to be the men of God in the land, who are supposed to be caring for the people, loving on the people, were sinners. And really, in this case, horrible, nasty sinners. So that all Israel would see it, and would know about it. And so even the priests of God were not exempt from this truth that sin needs to be dealt with. Eli was guilty of sin within the holy place. You would think somebody of his stature, somebody of his renown, somebody of his position would know better than this would know better than to sin or would know better than to let his children go about doing these things, would know better than to take food that wasn't his and to tax the land even more so than what God said was to be done. But it really shows us that no matter who the person is, no matter who you are, you are a sinner. I am a sinner. Romans 3, if you go to Romans 3, lays this out very clearly in many different places. It tells us that none are righteous, no, not one. It tells us that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The psalm that we read in Psalm 51, David himself, a king after the Lord's own heart, finds himself in a situation where his sin needs to be dealt with. Why? Because he's a sinner. 
And sin has to be dealt with. And here's just the facts. Sin does carry with it consequences for today here on earth. You can't avoid that. I think a lot of people think that now that I'm a Christian, I've trusted in God, I've been forgiven of my sin, that that means sin no longer has consequences. You'd be very badly mistaken if that's what you think. Because sin carries with it a lot of consequences on this earth. Many of us today face all kinds of struggles. Why? It's simply because of the sin in our life. I don't think I have to delve into this too much. I think you understand it inherently in your life because you can see it. You can look to things in your life that are out of whack and that are out of place. And if you start to work at the timeline in your head, you can go back to a point in time to where maybe you made a decision that was against the will of God and you knew it. Or you, you in your life, you continually allow anger and rage to take over in your life. And you just can't understand why I don't have any joy in my heart. Well, let's go back and let's look at your life. It's because of the sin of anger that is constantly dwelling up inside of you. It has consequences for us today. I don't think that this can be avoided. Even secret sin has an impact on our heart. We see this played out in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 26. You might be sitting where you are today and you say, but nobody knows about this sin. It's not going to affect anybody but me. You're wrong. Your sin, even your secret sin, has an impact on the things around you and the people around you. Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 26. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and these like things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I want to stop there. You say, how does this tell me that my sin, my, my personal secret sin is going to affect other people? I'll tell you why. Because as you sin personally you start to exhibit the characteristics that were said in the first couple verses. Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. This is built up inside of us as we sin. It becomes who we are. And it affects the people around you. Husband, as you have a secret sin in your life, whatever that may be, I want you to know you are bearing that wrath out on your wife. I can guarantee it. The anger that you feel about yourself, the embarrassment that you have about yourself for the secret sin, the fact that maybe it hasn't been dealt with, I guarantee you pour that out on your wife and your children. Undoubtedly. It's because we can't handle sin in our life. We can't deal with it. This is what comes of it. The opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. But as we deal with sin according to Scripture, the Bible is very clear that we will start to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. And if we live a life that is full of the fruits of the Spirit that God talked about there, love, joy, peace, patience, all those things, do you think that will have an impact on the people you come in touch with on a daily basis? Yeah, for the good. But when we don't deal with that secret sin, when we do not let God root it out of us, it definitely has consequences now. And if that's not enough, if it's not a consequence here, there absolutely is a consequence in eternity because of our sin. We see this all throughout Scripture. That sin is an affront to God. That, it is, that it, when we sin, what we are actually doing is we are putting our desires before God. We are making our own little idol and we're putting it up on the pedestal and we are saying, this is what I'm going to follow. This is what's going to determine my life. This is going to be my God. You say, well, man, that's pretty drastic. I know, sin is a big deal. When God clearly says, hey, don't do this, and you say, yeah, but I really like that. It feels really good. You are carving yourself an idol to worship that is not God. Thus, you're already falling short of the second commandment that we find in Scripture. Those cute little things that we teach our kids, the Ten Commandments, you are already failing 
in the one that says, do not carve for yourself a graven image. We do that every time we sin. And it is absolutely an affront to God. And so because of this, because of this sin in our life, we are enemies of God deserving his wrath, deserving his punishment. And scripture is very clear. The enemies of God will not have a part in his kingdom. Please hear that. For all of the consequences that could take place on this earth, none of them compare to the eternal consequence of being told, you are not a part of my kingdom. You have no place here. There is a grave danger in hearing that being told to you when you stand on the precipice of eternity. Please go away from me. I I never knew you. You're not part of my family. You're an enemy of mine. This is the consequence of your sin. You are separated. You can't be here with me. And this is what the Bible teaches us. My fear is some in here. That would be you. If you stand before God, you haven't haven't allowed God to deal with the consequences of sin when it comes to eternity. And so, the decision doesn't hang in the balance. No, the decision is there. You're out. You're his enemy because of the sin in your life. But we see good news in Samuel as well. And we see it in this woman, Hannah. We, we see that God cares for the hopeless. We are hopeless in our sin. As we stand before God, we're absolutely hopeless. There's nothing that I can do to make up for my sin. There's nothing that I could say. There's, there's no action that I could partake of to help in this. Just like Hannah, you have this woman who cannot have a kid. There's nothing she can do to fix it. There's nothing whatsoever. And she knows this and she realizes this. She, so much so that she just falls on her face before God repeatedly. God, I want to have a child. God, can you do something? No matter what I do, it's just, it's just not working. And you have to believe they had old wives' tales just like we do today. She had to have tried everything to get pregnant. But there was nothing she could do. Just like the sinner standing before God, hopeless, guilty. There's nothing that you can do. But we see that just like Hannah, God gave her hope. God changed her situation. God changed inside of her and gave her now the ability to have children. That was something that God worked inside her. God had given the hopeless hope. God had given the worthless worth. And it's the same with us in our sin today. Somebody who is dead in sin cannot revive their heart back. I've seen a lot of weird movies. I've seen a lot of crazy things. I've yet to see a movie try to convince me that there's a guy laying on the ground dead and all of a sudden he starts taking his fist and pounding his own chest and giving himself CPR and then he comes back to life. Why do we not see that in the movie? Because it's utterly stupid. Sorry to say that word if that's bad to your kids. We would look at that and we would say, that is ignorant. You would turn that off. You'd say, this is just so ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous for us to think that we could stand before God and say, God, I know I'm dead in my sin, but just wait. I'm going to make myself alive. There it is. I'm alive. It doesn't work that way. God makes us alive. God gives us life. Just like he opens up Hannah's womb, he can open up our eyes to the truth of the gospel. To the fact that he has made a way for the hopeless to have hope through Christ. That he bore the wrath of God on the cross. That he paid the price of sin. That that he paid the ransom that was necessary. That he's done everything that needs to be done so that you and so that I, as we are called by God, can be revived to life. That we can be brought to life. That the dead can walk so that the dead can be raised. When we see Hannah and what God has done for Hannah, 
It should be a beautiful picture of what God has done for you if you are a Christian. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ, it should be a picture of what God can do for you to save you from your sin, to help you to see the wretchedness of it, the dirtiness of it, and to help you to see that Christ has paid for it and that Christ's blood will cleanse you white as snow and that you will then be in right standing with God because of Christ's righteousness. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So how great of a story is it? Ladies, again, I think you can understand this better than me. For a woman who is barren all of a sudden to give birth, how good does that feel? I have to think, amazing. I have to think, on top of the world. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. You're telling me that I can go from an enemy of God, deserving to be cast away from God forever and ever and ever, but God in His great grace sent His Son to die on a cross for me into my place, and that he will save me by his grace through faith, and that I then am not an enemy anymore, but I now am a child of God, an heir to the throne. I inherit everything that is God's. You're telling me that that is possible? Absolutely. That's what the gospel teaches us. And you talk about good news. You talk about exciting news, the fact that you can be saved from your sin by God. Well, that's what leads me to my last thing. Then our only response, if that is true, and if that has happened in your life, and you would sit here and say, I thank God. God has done that for me. He has took me from dead to alive. He has took me from enemy to child. Then I think our only response can be what Hannah's response was in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Look what she says. Hannah's song. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. This is her kind of talking to herself, but I think also to her sister-in-law or whatever it's called, her other husband's wife, her husband's wife. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength... No man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Notice this. She's kind of prophesying here. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Because of what happened in Hannah's life, praise exuded from her. She couldn't help it. Now listen, I have to believe this though. I think I have time. I have to believe this though. Just like every parent who's ever been so happy to hold that newborn in their arms, there comes a time when you want to choke that child out. There comes a time when the blissfulness is dead and gone. And it's a big struggle, is it not? I would have to think that Hannah experienced the exact same thing in her life. Oh, at this moment, 
praise exuded from her because of what the Lord had done. But there's no doubt she had dry times in her life where she struggled, where she wondered, God, you've done this for me before. Could you maybe do it again? I'm hurting right now, all these different things. But we need to know this. No matter what situation she found herself in, no matter how frustrated she was with her child, it does not change the fact of what God had done for her. He had, she had went from barren to fruitful. Christian, we need to hear that. No matter where you find yourself right now in your relationship with the Lord, fruitful and just feeling it are dry and extremely frustrated. It does not change what God has done for you in your life. Your sin is washed away. You're not his enemy. You are his child, and he loves you with the love of a father. He would say, if your father knows how to give good gifts, what about me? You don't think I can give better gifts? You don't think that I care for you? Listen, God loves you so great, and what he deserves in return is our praise. He deserves us to praise him. He deserves us to honor him with our life because of the good thing that he has done for us. We were once dead, and now we are alive. We had no hope, and now we have a surety of hope. The world doesn't have that. The world cannot promise that. Only God gives us that through Christ. And so I hope in your heart that it causes you to praise him. I hope that it causes you to lift up his name in your home, in your car, at work, around people, that they would know for sure whose you are because of the excitement that you have welling up inside of you for what he has done for you. If you're sitting here this morning and you have sin that needs to be dealt with, can I say that's those of you right now who feel really dry? You have sin that needs to be dealt with. For those of you who feel fruitful, you do too. We all do. It'd be a shame for us to leave this place and not acknowledge our sin before God. We know he's already forgiven us of it. We know he loves us for those who are his child. But maybe this morning you need to spend some time in repentance. Seeking God and saying, God, forgive me of this. This is the path I've gone down. These are the things that I'm doing. This is the secret sin in my heart that I need to pour out before you. God, God, help me with this. Not so that he'll love you again, but because he loves you, because he's forgiven you, you lay that down at his feet. You come to him to say, thank you for forgiving me of this. Now help me to live worthy. Help me to live holy life. Or maybe you need to spend some time as we close just in praise. You haven't praised God in a while. You haven't thought back to that time when he saved you by his grace You've taken it for granted. You've overlooked it. You've allowed the things of the world to creep in. You start to determine your worth based on your job, based on your money, based on your current situation. Maybe you need to spend some gut time thanking God just because of who you are in Him and the promise that He's given you, that eternity is wrapped up for you. It's promised you are an heir to the throne of grace. So maybe you just need to spend some time praising Him. Let's bow together, let's pray. And then after that, we'll sing a song and that's time for you to respond to God's word how you see fit. God, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this book. God, help us as we go through 1 and 2 Samuel. There's so much there. It's hard to cover it all. It's hard to do three or four chapters a week. And so God, help us to see the truths in it. Help us to see your grace and your glory in it. But God, I pray that you would help us this morning. Help us to deal with sin in our life. Help us to acknowledge it. God, by your power, the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to overcome those sins. To, God, I'm sure many of us would love to right now conquer it and never deal with it again. But for most of us, it's a, it's a daily battle. And so, God, I pray that daily we would see growth in those areas. And God, because you love us, you give us the ability to overcome those through the power of the Holy Spirit. So help us, help us in that. But God, help us to be honest with you during these last few moments as we sing this song. Help us to praise you because of what you've done in our life. God, if you've done nothing else for us ever, but you've saved us by your grace, there's nothing we could ever ask for. Because there's there's nothing that overcomes that. 
So God, during these last few moments of this service, help us to honor you. Help us to honor your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, let's sing. O oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resist your holy war. You have loved and purchased me, make me yours forevermore. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joy. Then your spirit gave me light, opened up your word to me through the Son gave me endless hope and peace. Help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart. God, you alone are worthy to be praised. God, forgive us for the times in our life to when we give the praise that you are due to other people, other things, or even to ourselves. God, forgive us of that. Help us to see that error in our life. Because God, you alone are worthy of that praise, the praise given to one who can save our soul, who can fix our problem that we have of sin. But only you can do that. I can't do that for myself. Nobody can do that for me. Only you can. And God, you've done that through Christ. And so you deserve that praise. And so God, help us to praise you in that way, individually, as a church family. God, help us to have a passion to see other people to praise you that way. And so God, I pray that that would be a driving force in us, sharing the gospel with people, telling the good news of the gospel to our friends and to our family, those whose sin has not been dealt with yet through Christ, that we would have a passion to see that happen. Put that on our hearts, God. God, we thank you for the hope that you've given us. God, make us a hopeful people, not a people of fear, not a people of resentment or any of these things, of anger, wrath. God, help us to be a people of hope and of joy and of love and of peace. God, that that is in our heart and cemented there because of Christ, because of his work. God, as we leave this place, again, give us that joy so that others can see it and so that you can be glorified in everything we say and everything we do. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you would have a seat, we're going to dismiss, continue to dismiss how we do. Remember, we're going to have nursery next week, and so you can let other people know that as well. There's a new sign-in system that will be up and going there, so there will be 
people there, I'm sure, to give instructions for that, but that'll be uh, next Sunday. We look forward to that. I do thank you guys for being here. Outside sections, if you guys want to go ahead and go. Next two sections. Next two sections, please. All right, then our middle sections. God bless, guys. Have a good week.